Well, let's first of all talk about what lectins are. So lectins are something we call a carbohydrate binding protein. So that's a bit of a fancy name. So what does that actually mean? Well, it's a protein that literally will attach to a carbohydrate or a sugar. And we have lectins contained in animal foods and we have lectins contained in a lot of plant foods. And some lectins have actually been shown um, quite reliably to be associated with autoimmune disease. Now, for the most part, those lectins are plant-based lectins. So generally when we talk about lectins, we tend to think of plant lectins because they're the ones that are most deleterious. And the most obvious lectin that everybody has heard about is something called gluten. And, uh, and gluten is associated with a lot of autoimmune disease. We know that so type 1 diabetes where your body's immune system will actually attack your own pancreas from the inside, that's an autoimmune disease. And we know that mothers who consume the most gluten while they're pregnant, their children have double the risk of having conditions like type 1 diabetes than mothers who are consuming the lowest level of gluten. So have no doubt this is absolutely real. We know that gluten is associated with uh, the most common autoimmune kidney disease called IgA glomerulonephritis. And there's actually done some studies where they actually take a biopsy, they actually cut a bit of the kidney out and measure the autoimmune reaction looking at something called antibodies. And they've shown that when people go on gluten-free diets, the level of these autoimmune antibodies fall. We've got a really nice pilot study looking at the most common autoimmune disease against the thyroid called Hashimoto's thyroiditis and shows that when you put ladies with high levels of these antibodies, thyroid antibodies on a gluten-free diet, over six months, these antibody levels reliably fall. So we certainly know that gluten is a problem and gluten's not the only lectin. There's other lectins like uh, concavalin A and uh, wheat germaglutinin, and some of these other lectins can actually stimulate the insulin receptor. And this is really powerful. You mentioned, you asked me to comment on something called de novo lipogenesis before, where the body basically turns carbohydrates into fat. Well, this is done um, often under the action of insulin. And the interesting thing is, They've got studies that demonstrate that the ability to force the conversion of carbohydrate to fat is stimulated even more powerfully by these lectins, some of these lectins acting on the insulin receptor than even it is done by insulin itself. So they're certainly not benign. Now, Parkinson's disease is what we call a movement disorder in the brain. It involves something called the substantia nigra of the basal ganglia. It's basically something just deep in deep within the brain. And it's characterized by people having a tremor. Uh, the, the movements are very rigid and they, they have trouble moving, um, uh, initiating movement and they're very stilted. Um, they're often very unsteady on their feet. Um, we see characteristic things. There's a few odd things about it. Like when they handwrite, they have what we call micrographia. Their handwriting ends up getting very small. They sort of lose the ability to form letters normally. But the interesting thing is the animal model of Parkinson's disease is based on something called P-lectin. So this carbohydrate binding protein that comes from peas and if they want to uh, study Parkinson's disease in dogs, they have to give the dog Parkinson's disease first. So they give them a chemical to increase the leakis, leakiness of their gut, and then they give them peas. And what actually happens is that P lectin is able to travel its way from nerves, from the, from the gut all the way to the brain. It's called the vagus nerve. And those lectins then end up in this part of the brain, the substantia nigra, where they sit on neurons that secrete a neurotransmitter called dopamine. We call them dopaminergic neurons. And we've actually got some beautiful evidence um, that this occurs. So in the dog studies, they were actually able to attach a fluorescing molecule to this P-lectin. And so when you look at it under a microscope, you could basically see it glowing. And after they gave these dogs um, Parkinson's disease, they euthanized them and autopsied, biopsied their brain. And they were able to see 
that these fluorescing or glowing P lectin molecules were actually all accumulated in the substantia nigra of the dog brains. And then they cut these nerves, the vagus nerves that these lectins were traveling up from the gut to the brain on, and they found that they couldn't give the dogs Parkinson's disease. And then there was this beautiful study that was done in Denmark where they actually, what we used to do, we used to do an operation called a vagotomy where we'd cut the vagus nerves because we thought it was good for stress ulcers. Completely and utterly wrong, but it used to be a very common operation. And in the Denmark population, they, they basically, if you've had a medical procedure done, they can accumulate the data from the whole population. They've got a fantastic medical record system there. And over a long period of time, I think it was 25 years or something, I haven't looked at the paper in a while, they found that if you'd had this operation, then your chances of developing Parkinson's disease was reduced. I think it was in the order of 47% or something like that, um, which is, I think, a really good indication that, yes, these lectins are a problem. And I think the fact that we use P-lectin as the animal model of developing Parkinson's disease is very illustrative. And I've had several patients who have actually come in, uh, when I say, th I think about three or four, who have all said they used to consume either a lot of peas or a lot of peanuts, which is a legume and they're, they're called peanuts because they're sort of like peas. So uh, I certainly think there's something there.